Welcome everyone to this uh, presentation on chapter 4. This chapter looks at how societies are organized and how they've changed over time. We'll begin with a look at a, a contemporary sociologist, Gerhard Lenski, and you'll also become familiar with the classic ideas of Karl Marx, Max Weber, and Emil Durkheim. Now, society refers to people who interact in a defined territory and share culture. And indeed, societies are diverse and they're at different stages of development. Here's a picture of Tuareg women from the Sahara in North Africa in a birth celebration. Now, these are people with a pastoral nomadic lifestyle. The women typically have high status in this culture. Here are some fishermen from Thailand. Thailand is known for its abundance of various species of fish. Here's a street scene in Calcutta, which is now known as Kolbata in India. It was a center of culture, arts, movies, and education before going through some economic decline. It was also the uh, center of the world's longest serving democratically elected communist government. It has recently made some pro-market economic reforms, which have led to some economic growth of late. And here's a picture of an American city in a post-industrial society. Let's take a quick look at the sociologists we'll be covering in this chapter. Gerhard Lenski stressed technology is what helps define a society and what a society considers to be possible. Lenski's work helps us to understand how societies are defined by the productive technology of hunting and gathering, or pastoralism and horticulture, agriculture, industry, and post-industrial computing. Social conflict, according to Karl Marx, both defines a society, and it's also the energy that drives onward the process of social change. Now, what Lenski considers to be a process in which agriculture gives way to industry, Marx saw as a system of class conflict, and society was transformed by class revolution into a system of capitalist class conflict. Max Weber said that ideas are what shape society. In contrast to Marx's materialist view of society is Weber's idealistic approach. Weber explains the power of ideas to define a society. Agrarian or feudal society is to Weber built on a traditional worldview. Industrial or capitalist society is marked by what he called a rational worldview. Durkheim was interested in how societies hang together. All societies hang together, but as Emil Durkheim explains, the basis of social cohesion shifts over historical time. Agrarian societies are held together by something he called mechanical solidarity, whereas industrial societies depend more on organic solidarity and a more pronounced division of labor. Gerhard Lenski described how technological development has shaped the history of human societies. He focused on sociocultural evolution, the changes that occur as a society acquires new technology. According to Lenski, the more technological information a society has, the faster it changes. New technology sends ripples of change through a society's entire way of life. All the thinkers in this chapter recognize the importance of technology to shape individual lives and all of society. Lenski explains that advancing technology expands the range of societal options, as well as increases economic productivity. Marx, too, recognized the productive power of industry, but was more concerned with how categories of people related to the means of production and how some benefited from it far more than others. In our times, the most important technological development has been computing. The information revolution is unfolding as we have access to instant news and social media. We have more complex personal computers and even smaller and more powerful smartphones. Technology can provide a powerful boost to access economic information and to increase productivity. 
Yet, what is possible for some is not always available for others. So how much of the world has internet access? Well, a recent report by the United Nations says nearly 3 billion people around the world have access to the internet. But 4.2 billion remain unconnected. That means almost 60 percent of the world's population still doesn't have the internet. Now this is interesting. In worldwide Gallup polls, we've noticed there's been a steady increase in homes that have access to the internet. In the most recent poll, 148 countries were surveyed. In some countries, fewer than 1 in 10 said yes to this question. Does your home have access to the internet? Now it's important to note that these results indicate the percentage of adults who answered yes to the question rather than the exact percentage of households with internet access. Some may have answered yes even though their internet access is through other means such as schools and libraries, internet cafes, or smartphones. Lenski identified five types of societies based on technology and sociocultural evolution over time. The first one are the hunting and gathering societies, which use simple tools to hunt animals and gather vegetation. Until about 12,000 years ago, all humans were hunter-gatherers. At this level of sociocultural evolution, food production is relatively inefficient. Groups are small, scattered, and usually nomadic. Society is built on kinship, and specialization is minimal. These societies are quite egalitarian, and they rarely wage war. Horticultural and pastoral societies employ a technology based on using hand tools to raise crops. Pastoralism, technology that supports the domestication of animals, develops instead of horticulture. But in either case, these strategies encourage much larger societies to emerge. Material surpluses develop, which allows people to become full-time specialists in trade, uh, crafts, or religion. And note that how increasing productive technology creates social inequality. Agrarian societies are based on agriculture, the technology of large-scale cultivation using plows, harnessed to animals, or more powerful machinery. These societies initiated civilization as they invented irrigation, uh, the wheel, writing, and numbers. Agrarian societies can build up enormous food surpluses, and they can grow to an unprecedented size. Occupational specialization increases, money emerges, and social life becomes more individualistic and impersonal. Inequality becomes much more pronounced, and the power of the state is based on religion. Industrial societies are based on industrialism, the production of goods using advanced sources of energy to drive large machinery. At this stage, societies begin to change quickly. The growth of factories erodes many traditional values, beliefs, and customs. Prosperity and health do improve dramatically. Occupational specialization and cultural diversity increase. The family loses much of its importance and appears in many different forms. And finally, post-industrial societies are based on technology that supports an information-based economy. In this phase, industrial production declines, while occupations that process information using computers grow. The emergence of post-industrialism dramatically changes a society's occupational structure. The United States is classified as a post-industrial society. Let's move on to Karl Marx's ideas, and his analysis stresses social conflict, the struggle between segments of society over valued resources. Marx divided society into profit-oriented capitalists, or people who own factories and other productive enterprises, and the proletarians, people who provide the labor necessary to operate factories and other productive enterprises. Marx believed that conflict between these two classes was inevitable in a capitalist system. And this conflict could end only when people changed capitalism itself. 
All societies are composed of social institutions, which are the major spheres of social life organized to meet human needs, such as the government, schools, and families. And he considered the economy the infrastructure on which all other social institutions were based. The institutions of modern societies, he argued, tend to reinforce capitalist domination. Marx's approach is based on materialism, which asserts that the production of material goods is what shapes all aspects of society. And according to Marx, people in modern societies don't pay much attention to social conflict. And this is because they're trapped in false consciousness, which are explanations of social problems that blame the shortcomings of individuals rather than the flaws of society. Marx argued that early hunting and gathering societies were based on highly egalitarian primitive communism and that society became less equal as it moved toward modern industrial capitalism. Again, industrialized capitalism contains two major social classes, the ruling class and the oppressed. And he said conflict between the classes over the distribution of wealth and power in society was inevitable. Needless to say, Marx's view is pessimistic. Uh, Marx also condemned capitalism for promoting alienation, which is the experience of feeling isolated because you feel powerless. Marx argued that industrial capitalism alienated workers in four ways. Alienation from the act of working itself, alienation from the products of work, alienation from others, and alienation from human potential. The term disposable workers has been used recently and it reflects a current concern in, in many societies. This is where people are, are worried about job security, their benefits, and being underpaid. And this alienation is related to Durkheim's concept of anomie, which we'll be talking about later. In contrast to Marx's pessimistic views, Max Weber's work reflects the idealist perspective that human ideas are what shape society. He used two world views, tradition and rationality. Weber wrote that members of pre-industrial societies embrace tradition. These are sentiments and beliefs passed from generation to generation. While on the other hand, industrial societies are characterized by rationality the deliberate matter-of-fact calculation of the most efficient means to accomplish a particular task. It was the Industrial Revolution and the rise of capitalism which brought on the rationalization of society. This change from tradition to rationality as the main type of human thinking. Now the author of your uh, text, Masionis, brings up an interesting question. Is capitalism rational? Weber considered industrial capitalism the essence of rationality, since capitalists pursue profit in whatever ways they can. Marx, however, believed capitalism was irrational because it failed to meet the basic needs of most of the people. Weber identified seven characteristics of rational social organizations, and uh, rather than go through them all, I'll just mention a couple specialized tasks. Uh, an awareness of time, technical competence, and impersonality. The growth of rational bureaucracy was a key element, according to Weber, in the development of modern society. Weber feared that the rationalization of society carried with it a tendency toward dehumanization or alienation, the feeling that uh, you're just a, a cog in a big machine or just a number. And he was pessimistic about society's ability to escape this trend. Moving on to look at uh, Emil Durkheim's ideas, he saw society as a complex, elaborate, collective organism, really far more than just the sum of its parts. It uh, shapes individuals' behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. Uh, 
He identified social fact as a pattern that's rooted in society rather than in the individual. And the function of a social fact goes beyond its effect on individuals and helps society to function as a complex system. Durkheim noted that people build personalities by internalizing social facts. So we have to examine the social forces in society that shape and influence people. Males and females learn gender roles very early in life through the family, school, and the media. Durkheim also uh, pointed out the importance of societal regulations to control behavior. Durkheim warned of anomie a condition in which society provides little moral guidance to individuals. And this can happen when individuals feel detached from society. The division of labor or specialized economic activity has increased throughout human history. Now, traditional societies are characterized by a strong collective conscience called mechanical solidarity. These are social bonds that are based on similarities. People are doing similar things and they have shared values. And it's called mechanical because it's an automatic sense of belonging. We're all very similar and we're together in this. Now in modern societies, mechanical solidarity declines and it's partially replaced by organic solidarity. These are social bonds based on specialization that unite members of industrial societies. And along with this shift comes a decline in the level of trust between members of the society. This organic solidarity uh, based on specialization refers to the fact that we need each other to do specialized things in our lives. Uh, however, we don't have uh, this mechanical solidarity so much. We're not necessarily sharing values and, and doing uh, the same things within a society. In conclusion, we've looked at uh, four different views on society, and we can pull out four factors that help to define a society. First is Alensky's view that technology helps define what a society considers possible. Marx's view involves social conflict, and he saw that as the energy that drives the process of social change. Worldviews can be traditional or rational, according to Weber, and he saw society as formed by human ideas. And finally, Durkheim's idea involves social cohesion. Shifts over historical time from mechanical solidarity to organic solidarity occur as there's a more pronounced division of labor.